We will now have a reflection or input from Mr. Ben White, a uh, very well-known journalist and writer, activist as well, who will speak to us on Israeli policies since 1948. Uh, Mr. White, please. Oh, you Uh, I'll just begin by extending my thanks to the uh, Russell Tribunal and to the uh, jury, to everybody here today, and to everybody who's watching also around the world uh, via the live stream. Uh, I have the slightly daunting task of trying to condense uh, Israeli policies since 1948 into uh, a, a short presentation, now with the added complication of it being uh, the session before a slightly delayed lunch. So I'm going to try and be concise but also uh, useful in uh, what I'm going to be bringing to you all. Uh, I'm going to begin just by uh, touching on a few <coughs> elements uh, of what it means for Israel to be defined as a Jewish state and obviously specifically uh, the implications of that for the Palestinian people. Uh, I wanted to begin that by, by pointing out um, the way in which in the very first few years of the state's establishment, key laws that were passed, uh, particularly the law of return, um, the absentee property law and the citizenship law, were the sort of uh, foundation stones for a regime of exclusion uh, and were defining uh, who was in and who was out uh, in this new state. And, those laws being instrumental in dispossessing the uh, expelled Palestinians uh, and obviously also opening up the borders of the state to Jews around the world. Uh, I think as has been noted already uh, during this uh, session today, uh, Israel doesn't have a formal constitution and something has been uh, mentioned of the basic laws that uh, Israel has passed, uh, which obviously kind of regulate various aspects of the, uh, the state, like the role of the Knesset and the army and, and so forth. I just wanted to mention one basic law, uh, the basic law Human Dignity and Liberty from 1992, <coughs> which is a useful way of uh, highlighting the disparity or the problematic nature of the relationship between Israel's identity as both Jewish and democratic. Uh, because this basic law, uh, while on the surface offering some sort of protection to minorities within the state, actually has an important qualifying uh, clause within the basic law that effectively says those rights can be abrogated uh, in the event that it is important to protect uh, the nature of Israel as a Jewish state. Oh, wow. uh, also just wanted to mention, uh, for example, within the context of uh, Israel's definition as a Jewish state and, and protecting that, uh, the fact that uh, a few years ago in 2007, uh, it was revealed uh, via the Prime Minister's office how the Shin Bet, the internal security within Israel, uh, was openly talking about how they would, quote, thwart the activity of any group or individual seeking to harm the Jewish and democratic character of the state of Israel, even if such activity is sanctioned by the law. Okay, so the kind of, and that wasn't, and that was, uh, you know, an open declaration that the <coughs> Shimbet was making. Uh, I also wanted to mention the role of um, para-state uh, bodies like the Jewish National Fund, uh, the World Zionist Organization, the Jewish Agency, uh, whose relationship with the state since 1948 has also been very important uh, in uh, being kind of part of the instruments of colonization and dispossession uh, and the way in which those bodies are delegated functions and responsibilities uh, that would normally be uh, part of the state's responsibility but in Israel's case those tasks are delegated to bodies that are constitutionally mandated to benefit only one group of people. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, looking at some specifics in terms of Israeli policies and you'll notice of course that given the title Israeli policies since 1948 I have to address uh, policies that have affected Palestinians in the 48 area in uh, pre-67 Israel's borders Palestinian citizens uh, but also Israeli policies in the West Bank and Gaza too uh, and I'll just make a point now that I'll return to at the end which is it's uh, very important for us to see the ways in which even when different legal mechanisms are being used, uh, that the main focus of Israeli policies towards the Palestinians, whether they have citizenship or whether they are citizenship less and uh, under military uh, rule in the West Bank and Gaza, 
the main focus of Israeli policies remains the same. Uh, establish a regime that benefits one group at the expense of another uh, with regards to land and natural resources and, and, other, and other things. So of course after 1948, and we've, had, uh, we've already had mention of the Nakba uh, already today, but after the ethnic cleansing that took place, bearing in mind of course that it was only the ethnic cleansing of 1948 that enabled the establishment of a Jewish majority in the first place, uh, after that, uh, a number of uh, laws, some of which I've mentioned already, were used to further the expropriation of land from the Palestinian uh, population, uh, and not just the Palestinians who had been expelled, but also uh, from Palestinians who had remained and become citizens, uh, and effectively the, the transference of Palestinian-owned land into the hands of the state, uh, sometimes via those organizations I mentioned, the Paris state organizations. Uh, quote-unquote abandoned Palestinian property uh, was given over for the establishment of new Jewish communities. Uh, and for example, in areas like Nakab, the Negev in the south, uh, the remaining uh, Bedouin Palestinians were confined to an area that was referred to as the fence uh, in order for the uh, area that they had been occupying to be freed up for uh, Jewish settlement. Uh, and Ilan mentioned the military regime that existed till 66. I also wanted to mention the fact that uh, until today, the Israeli state has a uh, focus uh, or an interest in what it refers to as Judaization of areas like uh, the Negev and the Galilee, areas that have uh, kept a, uh, a relatively high number of Palestinian citizens compared to other areas of the state, and therefore uh, are, focus, are a focus for the state's anxiety with regards to the, the, the demographic battle in the, in the state's perspective. Uh, that discourse of the demographic threat uh, is commonplace amongst Israeli academics, think tanks, politicians, uh, laypersons, the general public. The idea that Palestinians with citizenship <coughs> are a threat to the state simply uh, by the fact that they are Palestinians. Uh, and if you're wanting to see how that works out in practice, then you can remember the fact uh, that the law that currently means that Palestinian citizens, Israeli citizens, can't legally live with their spouse, if that spouse is a Palestinian from the West Bank and Gaza, the motivation for that law is not security, but a desire to make sure that Palestinians don't gain citizenship through marriage in the context of the demographic struggle. Uh, and then of course what happened after 1967 was that the same colonial logic was extended to the West Bank and Gaza, remembering West Bank including East Jerusalem too, uh, and I'm sure many of us are familiar with what's happened since 67 in terms of the uh, creation and consolidation of the uh, colonies, the illegal settlements. Uh, subsequently, that regime has been expanded uh, to include the separation wall, uh, the road network that connects the settlements to each other, various other kind of ways of limiting Palestinian access to territories, such as the creation of areas reserved for the Israeli military to train in, and these sorts of things. Uh, and to the extent that by now, in 2012, you have the existence of a de facto one state, a de facto single regime from the river to the sea where uh, the Israeli state sets policies that discriminate uh, and make a difference on people's lives depending on where they are and what sort of ID they have and what ethnicity they are. Now I'm going to uh, touch upon uh, as well, just want briefly, uh, economic marginalization and the way in which uh, the Israeli state has uh, targeted Palestinian economic uh, the ability for Palestinians to generate uh, um, kind of independent economics, not just within the West Bank and Gaza, but also uh, inside 48 area as well. Uh, there are tons of statistics to show the levels of inequality between Jewish and Palestinian citizens within 48. Uh, just to give you a, a couple of examples of these. Uh, in 2003, this figure was from close to half of all Palestinian families lived in poverty compared to around one in five Jewish Israeli families. Uh, in 2010, Palestinian citizens accounted for a third of all poor people in, in, in Israel. Uh, out of the 30 communities in Israel with the most unemployment, 27 of them uh, are Palestinian communities, and you could go on with the, this sort of uh, list. Uh, interestingly, actually, just as a kind of side note, although it's important, uh, in the last few years there's been an emphasis by the Israeli state on encouraging, uh, encouraging economic growth within the Israeli Arab sector, uh, and you have to realize that the reason for this is not a kind of sudden change in heart uh, about some of the, the fundamental aspects of policy, uh, but because the Israeli government itself realized that the, uh, uh, the way in which the, the Palestinian sector had been kept down economically 
was actually inhibiting the ability of the state as a whole to grow to the extent that was uh, required uh, from an economic point of view and the context of Israel's entry into the OECD uh, as well. Let me just check how I'm doing on the uh, time. There we go. Uh, when it comes to the West Bank and Gaza as well, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a complete fallacy to think of uh, the ability of an independent Palestinian economy, independent of uh, the Israeli regime and independent of the occupation. Uh, that's because there is no uh, practical means for the Palestinians to develop an independent e economy. Uh, and you can find that even in uh, you know, the reports of publications by radical groups like the World Bank and the IMF, uh, who, who will be quite clear, even in their own language, even in their own language, they'll be quite clear to say, look, you can pump as much aid as you want into the occupied territories, but there's never going to be a thriving independent economy while Israeli colonization and occupation practices persist. Okay, uh, obviously they didn't say uh, colonization. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to uh, mention as well uh, the fact that when you're talking about the displacement of the Palestinians, you're not just talking about something that happened in history. Okay? It's an ongoing Nakba that didn't finish in 49 or 50 or even 67, but it's carrying on today, and it carries on in both Israel proper and inside the occupied territories. And this again relates to what I was mentioning a bit earlier about understanding the nature of Israel's policies in this whole de facto one state. Uh, if you took uh, a sample of uh, events that have happened with regards to the displacement of Palestinians over the last few years, you'll notice that very similar things have happened to Palestinians in Nakab in the south, in the same way that Palestinians in the Jordan Valley or the southern Hebron Hills have been expelled uh, and had their properties demolished uh, too. Uh, and in both cases, it's with the same goal in mind, that of furthering or, or enabling uh, Jewish settlement and making sure that space is cleared for that uh, and marginalizing or eradicating the presence of the uh, Palestinian communities <laughs> there too. Uh, I just wanted to mention the fact that the reality of that forced displacement is reflected uh, in the language and reports again of internationally respected human rights bodies. I mean, this is the language that Amnesty International use. Quote, the quartet must face the facts on the ground in the occupied West Bank, escalating demolitions and whole villages threatened with forced eviction. Right, then how about this, these words from the EU Parliament? Uh, the EU Parliament called earlier this year for, quote, immediate end to house demolitions, evictions and forced displacement of Palestinians. Of course, whether that means the EU will then you know, decide to actually make uh, those realities of ongoing human rights abuses a factor in trade relations with Israel remains to be seen. But that is a, a, a positive development in the sense of the documentation of these policies by those sorts of uh, bodies. Uh, and I wanted to mention, I think, something that maybe has been mentioned before, which was the report by the UN's Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination earlier this year. Very important report, which is, uh, again, recommended to, uh, for you all to read and download. Uh, and they use language like de facto segregation, talking about Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Uh, and the, the sorts of policies that the committee uh, was analyzing uh, in, uh, in Israel and the occupied territories uh, were severe enough, again, in the language of the committee, uh, to cause uh, uh, them to remind Israel of the prohibition on apartheid. Um, and uh, that was the kind of first time that that sort of language had been used by that committee since uh, the days of South African apartheid. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna round it up there in case there is time for uh, a couple of quick questions. Um, but just to, just to kind of focus on that last section that I was talking about, about the ongoing uh, Nakba and the fact that it didn't stop in 1948. Uh, and that's something that is important for both our analysis of what's going on, but also as a way of spurring people into action as well, because there's things that haven't happened yet that could be stopped. Um, and we need to be able to look at what's happening there uh, with a clear lens, a clear prism, that the question of Palestine is not just the siege of Gaza, it's not just uh, the settlements in the West Bank, but it's a question of uh, decolonization and democratization uh, and the implementation of all the Palestinian people's historic rights uh, that will bring an end to this ongoing Nakba. Ben, thanks very much for being so brief. 
and helping us to get to lunch on time, Pierre. <laughs> and just to remind members of the audience that all the presentations are available online. Um, it gives us a chance to get a very quick question in from Cynthia McKinney. Thank you, uh, Mr. White, for um, your um, designation, I believe I should say, of this ongoing NACBA. Um, many prominent supporters of Israel here in the United States came together and wrote a document entitled A Clean Break. Do you see the conditions advancing toward Israel being able to make that clean break? And what does that portend for the Palestinian people and world peace if Israel does? Sure. Do you want to just clarify which part of the, which kind of aspect of that focus you want me to comment on? The idea that Israel would be able to act unilaterally um, in its own interest without regard to the concerns of, say, the United States, which might be a restraint on Israeli adventures around yep. the region uh, and the world. Well, in terms of whether Israel will be able to uh, exacerbate or even further these sorts of policies without regard for uh, international sanction or restraints, uh, well, it's hard to predict uh, things uh, in the future. Uh, I think that question for me makes me think of how the region as a whole is changing and how Israel's ability to act in certain ways I think is probably going to be in some ways more limited than uh, it has been in the past. Um, but on the other hand, um, before the massacres of Gaza in 2008-2009, maybe nobody imagined that something like that would happen or before the uh, ass uh, assault on the Pal Palestinian cities in the West Bank in 2002, perhaps nobody thought that would happen either. So there's probably a good lesson to be learned from history that one shouldn't be surprised but prepared for everything. Thanks, we have some time for another question from the tribunal, if anybody would like to pose a question. Thanks very much, Roger. I'm not sure this is directly relevant to what Ben has been telling us, but it's something that's been bubbling up in me, so I'd like to say it if I may. And that is in light of... Um, Can I be so bold as to ask you to speak directly it, it, into the microphone? In light of the testimony that we've heard from the witnesses, uh, Ilan Pape and Peter Hansen and Ben, uh, this morning, that testimony being both elegant, cogent, and compelling testimony, uh, sitting here as we are in New York City, um, I'm bound to say, and having been told by Peter Hansen how the UN lacks teeth, partially at least because of the US power of veto and so on and so forth, and that slowly the evidence builds. Um, it's hard to sit here and ignore the elephant in the room. Um, this elephant being uh, the unfathomable influence in the corridors of power of the Israeli and Jewish lobby, uh, which sits over all these discussions when we sit here and talk to each other about, well, what do we do, what are we to do? And we talk about uh, public opinion and, and how um, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, yes, we, the public, listening to these compelling arguments, must have an opinion. And why is it that it's not being expressed by our political leaders uh, to the UN and in, in governments around the world? And uh, it has something to do with this elephant to which I refer. That's, that's it. Thank you. Would you like to comment? Uh, well, I mean, in my experience, uh, and kind of thinking about the difficulty of making our politicians uh, take action, um, there's a number of different factors involved, one of which is uh, obviously like organized pro-Israel groups. Uh, and in the US, uh, in a different way to the UK, that involves both uh, organized Jewish groups as well as uh, Christian Zionist groups, which I believe is going to be a topic uh, addressed uh, later in this uh, session too, in the tribunal. Um, but uh, on the, you know, in addition, uh, those pro-Israel groups find uh, uh, an ear because of the way in which 
uh, the foreign policies of our governments uh, fi have a role for uh, Israel uh, and that, that kind of, uh, they are open to that idea in the first place, I mean, in the, in, if that makes sense, um, that it's a, uh, a combination of economic, military and imperial interests that mean that there is a space for that lobby to, to kind of uh, uh, speak to. Thanks very much. And there are a number of topics coming up this afternoon and tomorrow. I know. Uh, the role of civil society and the state, etc. So there's no elephant in the room that will, will survive this uh, couple of days. <laughs> and I, I would like to, no, no applause please. When you, when you go for lunch, you can do a lot of clapping. But I'd like to thank all those who have um, presented this morning and done so well to help us reach the point here that the town table set out, 1 p.m. Pierre, so there you are. So you, you thank you. You do it very well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.